In our fall focus so far, we have been studying the life of Joseph. And we've been looking at his life and how he has been steady through the storms. And really what we see in in Joseph's life is he had a really interesting life. Like he just has an amazing story, doesn't he? I mean, just think about the story for a second. He grew up with sort of this interesting family dynamic where his brothers hated him. And so, like any good siblings, they, they sell him into slavery. And he's in slavery, and then he gets thrown into jail eventually. And then after that, he becomes the ruler, essentially. He's second in command over the entire nation. I mean, this is just a great story. This is the story you want to tell your grandkids about your life, right? You don't want to live it. But this is the story you want to tell your grandkids. You don't have to mention Potiphar's wife or anything like that. Skip over that part. But this is just a great story. But you know what? Joseph's story eventually came to an end. And this is what we're going to talk about in our lesson. We're going to talk about the end of the story. Because this is something that is common to all of us. All men who live on this earth, all men, their earthly stories will eventually come to an end. And when that happens, God is going to judge us based on what he sees. So we need to know what God is looking for at the end of our story. And that's what we're going to talk about in the lesson. We're going to essentially answer one question. What is God looking for at the end of our story? And we're going to look into Joseph's life to do this because Joseph came through the storms he was steady through the storms and at the end of his story we see some good qualities some qualities that we need to have so we're going to be in Genesis chapter 50 go ahead and open up your Bibles there that's the end of Joseph's story and we're going to take a look at some things that we need to have at the end of our story so what is God looking for at the end of our story Genesis chapter 50 we're going to start in verse 15 Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they say, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this commandment before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. In this section here at the end of Joseph's story, we see a number of qualities that are important for us to have, but I want to focus on one for right now, and that is loyalty. It's evident from this section of scripture that Joseph was loyal. Firstly, he was loyal to his brothers. You know, his brothers are worried. His brothers are afraid. They're saying, well, dad's dead, or dad is dead now, and there's nothing holding Joseph back. He's going to get his revenge. He's going to kill us. He's going to do, you know, whatever. So they're afraid of him, and rightly so. I mean, they did some horrible things. But the interesting thing is Joseph does not respond the way that they think he's going to respond. You see, Joseph understood something about their relationship. Joseph understood that their family And that family relationship is important. That family relationship is a priority. So for Joseph, that relationship was more important than maybe his feelings toward them. See, Joseph shows loyalty to his brothers. But notice with me, Joseph also shows loyalty to God. We see that in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, this is Joseph responding to their fear. He says, do not fear. For am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good so that, so that people could be kept alive. So here we see that Joseph is loyal to God. He is pointing to God and saying, God is the one who is in charge. God is the author and the ruler of history. And that just amazes me because Joseph had come through so many storms. He had gone through so many bad times, but he still looks at God and says, God is the one in control. 
I am not in the place of God. God is the ruler. So as Joseph comforts his brothers, he essentially says, you know, our father might be dead, but God, he is alive and he is in charge. So we see that Joseph is loyal. Well, at the end of our story, we need to be loyal also. We've got to be loyal to one another. You know, like Joseph and his brothers, their family. Well, we're family too, aren't we? We are a family, and, and this is not a relationship that we have built for ourselves. This is a relationship that God has brought together. God has built this relationship, and that tells us something. That tells us that this relationship is important. This relationship needs to be a priority in our lives because it's one of the most important relationships that we have on this earth. You know, the Apostle Paul understood this. Let's go over to the book of Philippians, please. The book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and in this context, Paul makes just an amazing statement, and I don't know if I'm there. I hope to grow to where Paul is one day, but Paul just makes this amazing statement where he understands the priority that the, uh, of our relationship, the relationship between brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 21. Here Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live on in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. So in these verses, we see that Paul has a choice to make. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So his choice is, do I want to live and do work? That will mean fruitful labor for me, or do I want to depart and go and be with God? And Paul doesn't know what he's going to do. He says, I am hard-pressed between, between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. So he's unsure of what he wants to do. But let's look at the next verse. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. So here what we see is Paul doesn't know what he's going to do. He doesn't know which to choose. He says, I can go and be with Christ, or I can stay here and work. I don't know. But then when we get to verse 24, he thinks of his brothers and sisters in Christ. He thinks of the Philippians. He says, for me, staying is more necessary for your sake. So that's what I'm going to do. You see, what Paul does here is he says, I'm willing to put aside eternity for a little while, temporarily. Why? For you all. For my brothers and sisters in Christ. Man, what an attitude to have, right? I don't know if I'm quite there yet. I love you guys. I don't know if I'm there yet. But Paul is willing to put aside his feelings towards eternity because he says that is far better. He's willing to put aside those feelings towards eternity for his brothers and sisters in Christ. See, Paul understands what we need to understand, that this relationship that we have is a priority. We've got to be loyal to one another. But also, we have to be loyal to God. And here's what that means. That means that we have to be on God's side. Our aim is to please God. I mean, this is what Joseph did. We go back to Genesis chapter 50. Genesis chapter 50, looking here at verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So why doesn't Joseph, you know, kill his brothers, get his revenge? Because that wasn't God's plan. God's goal was to save life. And Joseph is on God's side. And we need to make sure that we're people who are on God's side, a people who aim to please God. Because if, if pleasing God is our goal, then that clears up so much confusion. You know, sometimes we get in trouble, we, we ask, well, does God think this is wrong? Is God going to be angry if I do this, if I do X, Y, or Z? And that's the wrong question to ask, I believe. The question that we need to ask is, is God going to be pleased if I do X, Y, or Z? Because that's our goal. Our goal is to please God. So at the end of our story, we need to make sure that we're loyal. We're loyal to God, and we're loyal to one another. But that's not all, and that's not all that we see from Joseph's life. Let's go back to Genesis, and I want to read those verses again, starting from verse 18. Starting in verse 18, going down to verse 21. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. 
But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Well, what else do we see in, in this context here at the end of Joseph's life? What else do we see? Well, we also see growth. And we see this growth from what's missing in the text. Notice here in the text that there is no, there is no gloating from Joseph in the text. Now, you might say, well, why would there be gloating? Well, let's go back to the beginning of Joseph's story. Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. In this context, Joseph has two dreams. Uh, We can start reading from verse 5. Genesis 37 and verse 5. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then, after all of that, after he told this dream and they hated him, he had another dream, and he told them that dream too, essentially that they were going to bow down to him again. You see, in this context here at the beginning of Joseph's story, Joseph seems immature. It seems like he has some room to grow. It almost seems like he he could be gloating in Genesis chapter 37. But here at the end of Joseph's story, we don't see that immaturity. As a matter of fact, here, the brothers are bowing down to him, like the dream said, the brothers are bowing down to him again, because they've already done that once. And Joseph doesn't even mention the dreams. I have a feeling Genesis 37, Joseph would have been like, by the way, remember those dreams? But that's not what we see here. Joseph, at the end of his story, he has grown. Well, we need to have the same quality. At the end of our story, we need to have grown. We can't be the same tomorrow as we are today, and so on and so forth. I mean, have you ever seen the person who never grows up? who has never just grown up. Maybe this is someone you went to school with, someone you went to high school or college with, and now you're in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, and that person is still in high school or college doing the same silly stuff that got him in trouble way back then. What do you think whenever you see that person? i tell you what I think. It's, it's pretty sad. Because as we get older, we're supposed to grow and mature. You know, this is what Paul says in in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I know he's talking about spiritual gifts in that chapter. But he says, you know, whenever I grew up, whenever I became an adult, I did away with childish things. We understand that. As we grow, as we age, as we get older, we're supposed to mature. Well, that's true spiritually also. Just like it's sad to see a 40-year-old still acting like a teenager, It's equally sad to see someone who's been a Christian for 40 years still acting like they did 40 years ago. You know, this is what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews chapter 5. Let's go there. We're going to study this context here uh, for a little while. Hebrews chapter 5. And in this context, the writer of Hebrews is, is arguing for spiritual growth. He's saying that Christians need spiritual growth. Hebrews chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 11 or so, and one of the things he says about spiritual growth is that we need to grow in our thinking. You know, starting, and we'll just read verse 11 here quickly, about this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull or sluggish of hearing. He says that these people have become dull of hearing. They've closed their ears. What this means is they don't care about growth. These weren't people who were interested in deeply studying the word or having a good teacher. They were content where they were. They were closing their ears. They're not good learners. And this attitude had some detrimental impacts on their faith. Because of this attitude, they never learned to think like God. We see that. Let's pick up in verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. 
For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers discern, or uh, their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Here, we see that these people don't learn to think like God. You see, here the, the Hebrews writer says, you haven't come to the point where you can discern good and evil yet. You can look at the fork in the road and say, this is what God wants me to do, so I'm going to do that. And this is not what God wants me to do. That's evil, so I'm not going to do that. Because of this attitude where they don't want to study, where they don't want to learn, they never learn to think like God. But also, they never move past the basics. We see that uh, verse 12 again of Hebrews chapter 5. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You see, these people, they even need the basics. They can't move past the basics. Picking up in chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. What the Hebrews writer is saying is there comes a point where we need to move past the basic teachings. We need to move past the repentance the baptism, the resurrection. He's not saying that we just don't study these at all, but there comes a point where we should be studying more. And it seems like these people don't want that. They are just content with studying the basics. They do not want to grow. So the Hebrews writer says we have to grow in our thinking. But also, he says, we have to grow in our actions. We see this in verse 12 when the Hebrews writer says, you, are, you should have been teachers. You should be doing something. But you can't because you haven't grown. You haven't grown in your actions. You should be teachers, but you need someone to teach you. We also see this in chapter 6. Let's pick up in verse 7 of chapter 6. Here he's using a metaphor of the land, uh, and that's a metaphor for these people. It says, for the land has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, and he receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. Here the Hebrews writer is saying that if you've received God's blessings, and I'm just sort of translating the metaphor, if you've received God's blessings, then you know what you need to do? You gotta bear fruit. You gotta do something with it. You have to grow regarding your actions. But if you don't, if you don't bear fruit, well then, Hebrews writer calls you worthless. You see, we have got to grow not only in our thinking, but also in our actions. It's evident from the Old Testament and the New Testament that God expects his people to be a growing people, to be a maturing people. It cannot be the same tomorrow as we are today. So what is God looking for at the end of our lives? Well, he's looking for growth. But that's not all. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 50. We've got one more point for you, and then we'll be done here. Genesis chapter 50. And this time we're going to pick up in verse 22. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 22. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you. And you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed, embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Um, the last thing we see here at the end of Joseph's story is trust. You know, throughout Joseph's life, he was a man who, who trusted God. Through the storms, Joseph trusted God. And here we just continue to see that. You know, here at the end of the book of Genesis, we're sort of left with two problems. And these are two problems that need to be fixed. And the first problem is that God's chosen family, God's chosen family are not, what they, are not where they should be. God's chosen family are far from the land of Canaan. You see, they're in Egypt. But what does Joseph do? Well, Joseph trusts that God is going to bring them back home. And this tells us a little bit about Joseph. It tells us, first of all, that Joseph knew God's promises. 
You know, Joseph knew the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he mentions it. That means someone taught him. But also, he believed the promises. But we see something else in this story. Joseph also acted on the promises. And this is, and we see this when Joseph asked his brothers to bring him home. You know, notice what he says in the text. Does he say, you know, if God visits us? Is that what your version says? That's not what mine says. He says, God will surely visit us. And when he does, I want you to bring me home. See, Joseph trusted in God, and he had come through these storms, and I believe these storms taught him to trust in God. You see, at the end of Joseph's story, God could look at his book and say, Joseph is a man who trusted me. Well, at the end of our story, is God going to be able to say, well, Reuben trusted me? Because we need to. We need to trust God. And this isn't always easy, because the world is against that. I mean, even you look through history, the world is against God's words, God's power, and God's promises. In the New Testament, the Christians believed that God is going to come back one day. God was going to raise those who were dead, or raise the dead, and the people would live with him for eternity. The Christians believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. Well, the culture around them, they thought that was foolish. You Christians believe in the resurrection of the dead? What foolishness is what the culture said. Well, today is no different. God's words and power and promises are still at odds with the culture today. You know, the atheists, the atheists look at us and they say, you believe in that fairy tale where all the good people get to live forever, right? They make fun of God's promises. And our world today tells us that we need to trust self, wealth, and reason rather than trusting in God. Because sometimes, and let's just be honest, sometimes God's promises, God's words don't seem reasonable. But even when God's promises, God's words don't seem reasonable, we need to trust God. I mean, look at Joseph's story, especially whenever you move into Exodus. Joseph trusted that God would bring his people home. But whenever you move into Exodus, that really seems unreasonable. I mean, the Israelites, they were numerous, but they were the weaker nation. They were servants to a stronger nation. They were servants to a more organized nation. Reason would tell us the Israelites are not leaving Egypt anytime soon. But God keeps his promises, doesn't he? We need to make sure that we trust God just like Joseph. Because there's one more problem at the end of the book of Genesis. You know, I mentioned earlier... The first problem that God needed to fix at the end of Genesis was that God's people, his chosen family, were far from Canaan. The second problem at the end of Genesis is that mankind is far away from the Garden of Eden. I mean, think about it. The book of Genesis begins with this great creative act, doesn't it? In the beginning, God created the world, and he goes on to create life. He goes on to create humanity. But the book ends tragically. The book doesn't end with this great creative act. Instead, it ends with man in a coffin. At the beginning of the book, we find man living with God with an eternal future ahead of him. At the end of the book, we find man dealing with death. But this... It's the problem that we are left with. But the, qu- the question is, are we going to trust God like Joseph did? Are we going to be able to say at the end of our story, God will surely visit us and bring us home? Is that what we're going to be able to say? At the end of our story, when God looks over the pages in our lives, is he going to be able to say, we trusted God? In him. Is he going to be able to say we grew? Is he going to be able to say we were loyal? Let me say one thing before I end. I, I don't want to leave this lesson with the impression that, you know, you can live how you want right now and fix everything before the end of your life. 
because that's not how it works. Fact of the matter is, we don't know when our story is going to come to an end. So I, let me just leave you with this question. Do you have these qualities? Are you ready for your story to end? If your story were to end today, would God look through your pages and say, Reuben was loyal. Reuben showed growth. And Reuben trusted in me. Well, if not, then what are you waiting for? Maybe there's someone who wants to get right with the Lord because they know they're not ready for the end of their story. If you want to get ready, you could do that today. Or maybe there's someone else who wants to become a child of God so that they could be ready for when the Lord comes back, so at the end of their story, they can say, God will surely visit us and he will bring me home. If you want to become a child of God, if you want to return to the Lord, you can do that right now as we stand and as we sing. Be not dismayed.